I could have died when the bombs hit our building. I still remember how the floor above us and below us got taken out. I was five years old. I could have let living through a few wars make me angry and spiteful. I could have lost my mind when I saw two people get killed right in front of my face. I could have given up every time I've experienced sexism and inequity. I could have said, I'm done with this shit every time someone insulted my race, religion, or where I'm from. And I could have lost hope when I lost a baby at three months. And I could have complained when God gave me red frizzy hair <laughs> and glasses and freckles. I could have played victim every time something happened. But instead, I say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is a word we have in Arabic to say, I'm grateful for everything that comes my way. I learned that from my grandma. My grandma lost her home, her land, and as a result, my grandfather had a heart attack and died and left her to raise four kids on her own at the age of 26 and always, always said, Alhamdulillah. She taught me that there's always something to be grateful for. Every second, we have an opportunity to show up, to raise our voices, to tell our stories. It takes a whole lot of courage to get up in front of 3,000 people and talk about things that bring us to our knees. But despite that, we keep going, we keep laughing, we keep dancing, we keep singing, we keep playing, we keep challenging. Instead of saying, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? We have an opportunity to say, why not me? Why not me? To raise ourselves up and grow and become the people we need to become. You know, growing up in wars as a kid teaches you a bunch of lessons. For one, it teaches you that we're at our best when we're interdependent, not independent. We really realize this here in the West in times of natural disaster and crisis, because it's the closest thing we get to war. Two, resiliency. There's just something about this ability to bounce back that you carry with you your entire life. And three, when you don't know you're gonna be alive tomorrow, you sure as hell make sure today's a good one. I was going to college at the American University of Beirut when I got accepted for graduate studies in Richmond, Virginia, and I was a little torn. This was the early 2000s. We were, we were just coming out of the 90s in Beirut, which was post-war. Things were amazing. Everything was being rebuilt, and hope was everywhere. And I thought, do I really want to leave everyone and everything I love to put myself out there? But why not see what else is out there? So I landed in Richmond, Virginia, and within my first few months there, I was a little taken aback that so many people I met believed everything they saw in the media. <laughs> <laughs> the 
This was a little shocking to me because I come from a place where nobody believes anything anyone says. <laughs> so that inspired me to create this big installation art project with this huge mural. And on this huge mural were images and things that we were told to believe in the media. Live like this. Dress like this. Look like this. Vote like this. And underneath this huge mural, I had an opinions box that asked people to give their opinions. As people took time and carefully crafted out their opinions and went to put it in the box, I had secretly hidden a shredder in the box <laughs> that tore their opinions apart. Why not question everything that we've been told? Why not challenge the status quo? This project ended up making its way onto Dan Wyden's desk. To me, working at Wyden and Kennedy was the dream, the dream job I actually got. For 10 years, I got to create new role models, change the perception of women in the media, and get funding for things that mattered. Why not show real women in ads like we did with the Body Parts campaign? Funny little backstory, Vogue magazine refused to run that butt ad saying it was not appropriate for their readership. <laughs> in the end, we won. Skinny woman on the front, big butt on the back. <laughs> I got to inspire and empower millions of people I will never meet. I thought I could do no wrong, and I was on the biggest high of my life. And then one day, I walk into HR, and my eye catches a glimpse of something I probably shouldn't have. Of all the things I could have seen of the 624 people that work there, I happened to see how much my male writing partner was making. This was a guy who was working on the same project as I was, had the same numbers of years in the business, and the same amount of experience and talent. And I realized that this guy was not making 10% more than I was, or even 20 or 30 more than I was, but he was making twice as much as me. Two times as much. I mean, holy shit, double? This could have made me angry and want to go complain and get it right. But instead, it just liberated me. It made me go, why not take this as an opportunity to go out there, try some new things? I used to say, I used to give myself a little pep talk. I'd say, what's the worst that can happen? Like, I mean, really, it's only advertising. <laughs> so I left. I went on to freelance for every single agency out there, and I discovered that not only did I have this talent that people wanted and were willing to pay for, but people were willing to pay four times more <laughs> than me. <laughs> four times more than I was making four weeks ago. How's that for being courageous? <laughs> I went on to, you know, I was freelancing for about 30 different agencies, and freelancing for agencies slowly turned into freelancing for clients. And the more I did what I knew how to do, the more clients wanted it. And I thought, why not start an agency? So Red Co. was born. <laughs> uh, 
According to Fast Company, 45% of women dream of starting their own business. But only 12% think it's possible and way, way less do it. In the $190 billion advertising industry, 84% of women are either making or influencing all purchase decisions. But 89% of all the ads are either made or influenced by men. How does that make any sense? <laughs> In the United States alone, there are 13,356 advertising agencies. And of those 13,356 with national and global clients, 15 are founded by women. 15, that's 0.1%. How's that for a minority? Add to that an agency founded by a Middle Eastern woman, and I'm pretty sure we get down to zero. <laughs> but here's the thing. Three weeks after opening our doors, we had this tiny little client that happens to be the world's largest search engine. And we went on to do one of their biggest and most important initiatives to date. And we've had the world's largest yoga athletic wear brand as a client and the world's largest ride-sharing company as a, brand, as a client. Maybe women can start an agency. Since starting Ren & Co, we've been able to question and challenge almost every single thing out there. Why not always be experimenting and questioning? Why not be brave and daring and courageous? Why not run a business based on respect and admiration? Why not change gender bias with technology? Why not inspire millions of girls to code? Why not celebrate the men championing the women? Why not be each other's cheerleaders? Why not ask brands to consider, consider a women-owned agency for every project? Why not get a chance to prove what we can do? Why not embrace every gender, age, race, religion, orientation? Why not keep our minds open and free of judgment? Why not fight for what's right and fair and needed? Why not ask those hard questions? Why not show the next generation a new set of possibilities? And why not see how far we can go? And why not stop blaming the damn system and help create a better one? Nothing significant has ever happened without challenges. Without challenges, there is no brilliance. Let's say alhamdulillah and be grateful for everything that comes our way. If a red-headed girl with glasses and freckles and a big-ass afro 
can change a few things. Anyone can. So why not try? Why not now? Why not you?